I was naive to think that my divorce would solve all of my difficulties. My issues had only just started. Now, where did I obtain this wisdom? The same location I obtained the majority of my truly profound insights. School. However, this is no ordinary school. I learned this from what I jokingly refer to as the school of hard knocks. I'm sitting in this little airline seat, thinking about how bright and wise I am. But what I truly am is broken. My self-esteem is ruined. My health is ruined. My faith in justice is shattered. Everything is broken. Oh well, at least the view below is breathtaking. In another 30 minutes, we will arrive at my temporary haven from the pains of my life. We shall arrive at Duke's shortly. After two days of internet browsing, I discovered Duke's. It sounded like the perfect location to run away and hide. The description even stated that it was an ideal spot to hide, so why wouldn't I trust it? It was on the internet, and we always believe what we see on the internet, don't we? This is what I read. Duke's Lodge is situated on the shores of one of Canada's most secluded but scenic lakes, with abundant wildlife and some of the greatest fishing in the Northwest Territories. This is a wonderful starting place for day fishing expeditions, multi-day adventures, and overnight stays at one of Duke's secluded hideaways. And for the less adventurous. Nature's splendor is around, and it's only a short walk away from the lodge. With a little luck, you'll see Canadian geese, black bears, beavers, and moose. Duke's offers four furnished rooms in the lodge and six completely furnished cabins on the grounds. These rural cabins are great for unwinding from society and the demands of modern living. Our two-person cabins include one bedroom with either a double bed or two single beds. The lodge has two rooms that may easily sleep four persons each. Duke's is also perfect for simply concealing from your wife or husband. Meal packages are available on request. Long-term rentals are also available by request. To make reservations or travel arrangements, contact Duke Wayne. The description sounded so excellent that I called right away after reading it. The little float plane that departed Yellowknife an hour ago is now bumping and leaping over the snow-capped peaks on its way to that gorgeous lake, which will be my retreat for the next few months. I've never been on a float plane before. It's a bit unsettling. There are only eight seats, and the majority of the backspace is taken up by boxes for one pilot. I am the lone passenger. The noise from the props prevents anyone from accomplishing anything other than peering out the postage stamp-sized window. I'd like to sleep and receive some relief from my misery, but that's out. What I should do is sit and enjoy the view from 15,000 feet. But instead, I do the absolute worst thing. Possibly. I begin to recall the events leading up to my small float aircraft journey. Until a month ago, I was married to one of the most beautiful ladies in the little central Pennsylvania town where we grew up together. Her name is Sheila. The town is called Henley. Sheila was born on the opposite side of the track, the rich, high-class side of the tracks. However, I hailed from a working-class background. My father worked at the factory her father owned. But something happened that I cannot describe. Despite our different backgrounds, we married. So I moved from one side of the tracks to another. That happened five years ago. Two years ago, we welcomed a baby, not just any baby. This little lady is the most gorgeous and loving youngster on the planet. I'm probably saying exactly what every father says, but I know it is real. Sarah is a wonder. She is sheer joy. She is my motivation for living. When I look at her, I thank God for blessing me as he has. Sheila and I worked for her father's company, Bloom Enterprises. Sheila worked as a customer relations assistant, and I was an accountant. Sheila's father is Ezekiel Bloom. He's a dignified, gray-haired gentleman who nobody in their right mind would cross. He was also the wealthiest guy in Pennsylvania, which helped to put everyone on edge. He's also working on his fourth Miss Bloom, Jennifer, a beautiful trophy wife. Sheila and I, like many married couples, had ups and downs, but we were usually able to work them out without resorting to violence. Three months ago, I learned something that turned my life upside down. I discovered that Sarah is not my daughter. She calls me Data, and I call her my little angel. But a DNA test revealed that she is not my biological daughter. I curse the damn test. Why did I do it? I guess I was only trying to protect my little princess. We were waiting for our turn at the doctor's office for her annual exam when I came across an article that stated that conducting a DNA test on a child and their parents can assist 
offer an accurate medical history for the child, giving the healthcare provider additional information for diagnosing and managing the child's health. That sounded fair, given that my sister died a week after birth as a result of a congenital genetic defect that impacted her heart's development. I wanted to know if I had passed on that trait or any other difficulty to Sarah. Perhaps it sounded reasonable, but now I wish I had remained uninformed. I didn't inform Sheila that I got the DNA test done. I did not tell anyone. Because of the elder Mr. Bloom, I had no way of determining who Sarah's father was. He owned everything and everyone in town. So I had no one in town I could trust with my concerns. Before I could go home, the story would be relayed to my father. So I called a college mate who worked as a private investigator in Washington, D.C. to look into things and see what he could find out. He discovered that my loving wife, Sheila, had another man in her life. They had been together since before we got married. When I discovered who he was, it came as such a shock to my system. I had the evidence I needed to burn that cheating bitch at the stake, so I filed for divorce. That's when all hell broke loose. Sheila denied it. Her father stood by her like a rock. Sheila's attorneys overwhelmed and excelled my out-of-town divorce attorney. Despite my evidence of her betrayal, the judge decided in her favor, completely cheating me out of the bargain. I suppose I should have known what would happen because dear old Papa owned everyone in town, even the presiding judge. I was left with shit. The divorce would proceed. The court rejected the evidence I presented, and he forbade me from ever showing it to anybody else. If I did, my buttocks would be in jail before I could fart. That was an exact quote from the judge. Dear old daddy just sat there smiling as I had the shaft forced so far up my rectum. It came from the top of my head. I had to pay Sarah's child support. Even though Sheila lived in the luxury of the Bloom family's money, she maintained our home. I could keep the money I brought into the marriage. In other words, none. My visitation rights with Sarah were limited to one weekend each month supervised by a court-appointed guardian. Of course, I lost my job. I've lost my buddies. I lost everything, including my faith in the justice system. I got depressed, owing primarily to my inability to spend time with my daughter. That was the worst part of it. Sheila's father hit me the worst by taking away Sarah, the one thing I loved most in the world. Sheila said nothing because she never showed up for any of the hearings. It was just me and my lawyer versus Ezekiel Bloom and his army of attorneys. I was screwed repeatedly. So here I am in this noisy little float plane heading for a temporary safe haven. I'm an exile from everything rational and just. I did manage to get the shaft out of my rectum before I left town. The Bloom factory, which was my father-in-law's pride, inexplicably burned down. I had nothing to do with it, although I did bring some marshmallows. Wow! This is not precisely what I expected. I spoke while I stood on the dilapidated dock, gazing up at the lodge. Yes, many individuals say this when they come. It will grow on you. This piece of advice came from the pilot, who was unloading boxes from the plane's rear. The lake and surrounding mountains are breathtakingly lovely, but the description of the resort is, well, exaggerated. I had envisioned a large log cabin lodge with elaborate stone paths and ornate native carvings all over. It resembles an ancient, average-sized log cabin on a hill, with a dirt road extending from the dock to the porch. It appears clean, but not as grand as the description. Looking at my luggage on the dock and the twisting dirt walk up to the lodge, I assumed it would take several trips to bring everything up the hill. I took the two little bags and started up the twisting gravel road to the resort. Perhaps I should have read the prior guest's reviews first. As I enter the foyer of the rustic old lodge, I hear a deep, gravelly voice coming from under the counter. Could I assist you? Yes. My name is Leo Baker, and I have made a reservation for one of your cabins. Yeah, Mr. Baker. I had been expecting you, remarked the lanky, silver-haired man as he stood up. My name is Duke Wayne, and I am the proprietor of this small bit of heaven. Okay, don't look at me that way, boy. My real name is Duke Wayne. My mind is powerful, and I am a huge lover of cowboy films. They named me after their hero, John Wayne. I don't swagger like him, I just kind of limp around. So tell me, Mr. Baker, your registration indicated that you wanted to negotiate a long-term stay apart from your wife. Yeah, that's okay with me. But I'm not going to help you if you're trying to avoid the law. No. 
It's okay. It's simply a small domestic issue. I do not wish to be found for a while. I reserved one of your cabins, and yes, I would like to negotiate a long-term rental, if that is okay with you. Great. Actually, we close for the winter in October, although you are free to stay until then. The cabins are located up the road on the opposite side of the hill. It's a bit of a walk, especially if you have a lot of baggage. Oh, and we don't have many clients around this time of year, so you'll just have one other neighbor up there. Breakfast is at 8 o'clock, and we can discuss dinner plans then. If you need anything and don't see me, check the bulletin board over there. If I'm out working as a guide for someone, I'll post a notice. If you don't see a note, simply ring the bell on the front porch and take your seat. I will get there as soon as I can. Here is your key. This is cabin number two. Cabin two has the greatest view of all the cabins. Enjoy. Thanks. Is there a telephone here? How about cell phone service? No telephone or cell phone service. Remote. However, we do have a radio that we can use in an emergency or to obtain supplies. Most radios allow you to make phone calls. We are so isolated that everything has to be airlifted in and out because there are no roads leading to the lake. Great. See you at breakfast. As I travel up the hill with my bags, I realize how far up the road it is. Perhaps old Duke has a tendency to exaggerate things little. But at least I saw a lot of pine trees. Okay, here's number two. Home. It appears rustic. All right just as the commercial says. However, it said nothing about small. Perhaps it's bigger on the inside than it appears from here. As I enter, I notice that there is only a bedroom and a bathroom. There's barely enough room to change my mind. I've stayed in larger budget motel rooms before, but this one has the one thing I desire more than anything else in the world right now. Privacy. Let's check if Duke exaggerated about the view. I stroll out onto the small front porch and gaze at the lake. Actually, he might have been underestimating it a little. From here, I can see the entire lake. Everything is lush and green, and the lake reflects the sun and the neighboring mountains. The snow-capped mountains wrap around the lake, forming a massive green basin with extreme azure blue water at the bottom. Except for where I am standing, it appears that civilization has passed this location by. Unbelievable, I spoke out loud. Isn't that true? The disembodied voice came from a cluster of woods to the side of the cabin. This is the second time in my life that I've turned around and seen a beautiful creature approaching. After I say something foolish aloud. The first time, I met Sheila. And now she, whoever she is. Wow, she is something. She is short and slim, with her dark black hair pulled back into a ponytail. She's not frail, just a petite woman. The trousers and red flannel top hide her figure and her boots are far too large for her. Why is she holding a pail of water? God, I adore her skin. The hue of warm cocoa is pure and transparent. Her eyes are so dark that I cannot tell what color they are. She has a big, lovely grin and a cute pointed nose. She is clearly Hispanic and resembles someone from a Mexican tourism commercial poster, except she's missing the typical sombrero. Hi, you must be my new neighbors. I am Annabella, Annabelle Williams. I'm in cabin one just through the trees. Duke informed me that someone would be coming today. I've just been here a week, so I'm sure I won't know the answer to any queries you may have. Hi, yes, I am the number two. My name is Leon. Leo Baker. I am pleased to meet you. It is good to meet you, Leo. Are you going to remain for long? Yes. Actually, I suppose I'll stay here all summer. How about you? I do not know yet. For a while, I suppose I didn't know. What brought you here? I did not see you bring up any fishing gear, so I suppose fishing isn't the cause. Actually, I came here to get away from everything at home for a time. It's difficult back there right now, and I simply needed to get away and think. How about you? Why are you here? The same reason, actually. Problems at home. I needed to get away. Well, it was good to meet you, Leo. I'm sure we'll see each other around. See you at breakfast. Okay. Bye. Wow, she looks terrific. Walking away. Too lovely and filled everywhere I prefer. I haven't thought about another woman in that way since I met Sheila. I suppose I am permitted to now that I am almost single again. As I stood there watching her disappear into the trees, a notion occurred to me. I've never been a big believer in love at first sight. I know I had some lust at first sight experiences in college, but knowing you love someone on your first meeting seemed unrealistic. But right now, when I thought of this wonderful woman wandering through the woods... I had an unexplainable feeling. 
I do not think it is lust. She does, however, appear appetizing. But I'm also not sure if it's love. Maybe I felt a familiarity with her. Her entire demeanor made me feel relaxed. I hope to get to know her better. I'm curious if she's what I came here to find. Breakfast was not precisely what I was used to. Duke's breakfast is quite basic. Eggs, sausage, toast, orange juice, and coffee all fare well as long as I do not have to cook. The other two lodgers appear friendly. Obviously. Fishermen. Anyone who wears a vest with a thousand flies attached to it is a fisherman. Perhaps they knew something I didn't because they were staying in the main house. I have not seen Annabella anywhere this morning. Perhaps I should ask Duke. Hello, Duke. Where is the young lady with the cottage up near me? Anna. She came down early to eat. She said she had some job to do. Hell, all she does is sit on the bench at the top of the hill beyond your cottage and observe the birds. She does not like to be around people much. Something is upsetting her. Big time. But she won't tell me about it. Perhaps you can convince her to open up. Yes, I have my own concerns to worry about. I cannot afford to have other people's troubles tangled together with mine. There is no room in the old head and it may burst. We will do whatever you wish. But if I were fifty years younger, I would be pressuring her to open up. She's the most beautiful woman I've seen in twenty years since my Louisa passed away. Thank you, Duke. I will take it under advisement. For the time being, I believe I will simply return to my cabin and sleep. See you at supper. Damn, I did not intend to sleep all day. I must have been more weary than I realized. I believe been screwed repeatedly by your ex-wife and her family had its toll. Screw him. Screw him all. I hope I didn't miss dinner. Knock, knock. Annabella's beautiful voice came through the screen door. Hello, Mr. Baker. Hello, hi. Sorry, I am just getting up. I was simply intending to take a brief snooze. I think the thin alpine air is making me sleepy. How are you? I am fine. I was wondering if you'd had dinner. I didn't go down to the lodge for supper, so I opted to prepare a pot of soup. Do you want to join me? It is peaceful up here, except for the bear that comes by every morning, and I would like the company bear. Oh, do not worry. He will not disturb you unless you bother him. He basically prowls around outside to see what we left out for him to eat. You'll learn quickly enough. You know, I'd like some company, too. I think I missed dinner. So your soup is starting to sound appealing right now. Let me clean up a little and I'll come over. It just takes an hour to get through that clump of trees. See you then. I watched as she turned and walked away, carrying another bucket of water. She walked quite smoothly. And what a nice pair of jeans she has. Her hair falls to the center of her back, swaying from side to side with each step. Unbelievable. This time I didn't say it so loudly. She did say one hour. So fifty minutes is close enough, correct? Just think. Yesterday I was in Nowheresville, Pennsylvania, and now I'm on top of a mountain in Canada with one of the most stunning women I've ever seen. For the first time in months, I can declare that my life is going well, at least for the moment. Knock, knock. Hello, neighbor. Is anybody home? Mr. Baker, you are early. You should know better than to arrive to a woman's home early. I am not ready yet. Give me a few minutes. I can leave if you like. No, simply sit on the porch and enjoy the view. It isn't as great as yours, but it's still rather impressive. Oh, and call me Leo. Mr. Baker is my dad. I turned and sat, realizing she was right. The vista from this creaky old rocking chair is quite magnificent. I've never seen anything like it. The size of the mountains across the lake is difficult to gauge from here. They appeared to be touchable. However, I understood they were about a day's walk distant. The silence is terrible. The aromas in the air are a mix of pine and whatever Annabelle was preparing. Both smelled amazing. Okay, Leo, soup is on. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, crap. She is dressed for dinner. I'm sitting here wearing pants and a sports tee. Maybe I should have worn something lovely. I bet she looks stunning in whatever she wears. It's a simple light blue long-sleeved print top and dark blue pants. Her big, gorgeous smile is exactly as it was this morning. Or was it yesterday? The boots are gone and sandals have taken their place. Her hair is now falling straight down over her shoulders. She's extremely stunning. Hello, Leo. Wake awake. Here is your soup. Oops, sorry. I became preoccupied for a second. As you mentioned, the view up here is very beautiful. Flatterer. Come here and eat. It isn't elegant, but it's palatable. It is my own creation, so I hope you enjoy it. I can only offer you water to drink. Is this okay? Fine. Soup and talk pair well with water. 
It took us almost an hour to eat her delicious soup and discuss the basics of our lives. I told her about Pennsylvania. She told me about her hometown in Texas. I informed her I was an unemployed accountant, and she said she too did not work. I told her about Sarah, and she stated that she does not have any children. It was all very shallow and formal, but it was a start. Leo, why are you here? I don't mean to pry, but you don't look like a fisherman, and this is a really distant location. Someone might come here to escape from things. Is that why you are here? Well, that's a long story. It's still quite painful. I really don't want to worry about it right now, if that's okay. Perhaps later. I will be here for a while. I apologize. I do not mean to pry. That is okay. How about you? Same stuff. I have a long story that I do not wish to discuss right now. She pauses for a bit to take in the landscape. You have a greater view of the lake from your cabin. Maybe next time we'll eat at your place. I'd enjoy that. And thank you for the dinner. Your soup was excellent. I can't believe you made that dish on such a small burner. It was fantastic. Well, I should be leaving. Will I meet you for breakfast? Of course. I'll make a point of coming down. Have a nice night, Leo. I arrived at my cabin and stood on the porch, watching the sun fall over the mountains. It's stunning, to say the least. I could only hear the wind gently passing through the trees. In addition, there is the occasional bird chirp. Another unfamiliar sound came from a long distance away. It could be an owl, but I'm not sure. My bird has a good call. Everything looked better in person than it did on my old high-definition television. This must be what heaven is like. I don't normally let my food go cold, but this morning I sat across from Annabelle. Time slows to a snail's pace. It's the same basic food from yesterday. Eggs, sausage, and toast with tomato juice instead of orange juice. Today, there's also coffee. But the main difference is the company at my table. I signaled for Duke and he gave us a refill on our coffee. I'll take the other two out on the lake and show them some of the best fishing areas. I'll be gone for much of the day. Will you two be fine by yourselves? I gazed at Annabella and responded to both. We'll be okay. Maybe we'll go for the nature walk I read about on the webpage. As we headed back to our cabins, Annabella spoke. Leo, do you remember the nature walk you mentioned? You took it as you walked from the dock to the cabins. Wasn't it pretty? Perhaps there was far less to this facility than what I read on the website. She made me grin regardless. What are your plans for today? I don't have anything scheduled. I normally sit at the top of the hill on a park seat or on the dock to observe the birds on the lake. When the seaplane arrives, I generally help Duke unload the cargo. He never asked for it, but I'll do everything I can for him. He's offering me a discount on rent because I can't afford much here. Duke may not look it, but he is 76 years old. He has been alone in this place since his wife died 20 years ago. Duke is quite the character sitting by the water. That sounds wonderful. Can I join you? It would be my honor, sir, she said with a faux curtsy. So we went down to the lake and wandered. I spotted two ancient rocking chairs near a shed and hauled them up to the dock. We both sat silently for quite some time. We just rocked back and forth, gazing out over the lake and toward the mountains. Annabella turned away from me. She appeared to be about to cry. What is wrong? I asked. Nothing. Now I know something is wrong. Have I said anything? What can I do? I apologize. I have a lot of things on my mind. I do not want to concern you about my troubles. I'm sure if you're up here, you have your own concerns. I do not wish to add mine to yours. I was looking out over the lake, deciding whether or not to push her, when an old memory returned to me. When I was a kid, our church's preacher used to say that if someone had a problem, the best way to solve it was to talk to someone about it. Just chatting to someone would make your problems go away. He would say, if you want to talk, I'm willing to listen. You cannot give me any more issues than I already have, and perhaps I can assist with some of yours. That's kind of you. I'd like to speak with someone about all of this, but it's complicated and very personal. It is also embarrassing. You are a stranger. How can I simply unload my personal troubles on you? So how about we trade stories? I'll tell you a bit about me, and you'll tell me a little about yourself. You are not required to say anything that makes you feel funny. We can proceed as slowly as you like. I'll be an open book if you want to listen. Please believe me when I say that I will not judge you for what you have done. I will just listen. Okay, fair enough. But you go first. Where should I start? Usually, starting from the beginning is a good thing. 
I was wondering how much detail was too much. Okay, here goes. I was born and reared in Henley, Pennsylvania, a little working-class community. My father earned a fair wage in the factory, and my mother is what we now term a stay-at-home parent. My oldest brother and sister now live in various parts of the country. After receiving my master's degree in finance from Penn State, I returned to town since my father suffered a heart attack and my mother wanted me to help care for him on occasion. I met a stunning woman, fell in love with her, and we married. She was a girl from the top-class area of town. Her father owned the factory where my father worked and much more. He actually owned almost everything in town. Politicians and parking meters, too. My wife's name is Sheila. When I returned to town, I found a job as an accountant at the company her father controlled. She worked at the same company as her father's personal assistant. That is how we met. Our daughter was born two years ago. God, she made things so much better. I enjoy being a father, and I would have probably continued to spoil her rotten if things had turned out differently. I discovered, rather by chance, that I was not her biological father. That ripped my heart out. I love her more than everything in the world, but she is not mine. I discovered that my wife has had a lover since before we were married, and he mentioned his father. When I found out our marriage ended, I have all the evidence of her cheating. So I planned to divorce Sheila, take Sarah, and live with my folks until I got back on my feet. I didn't care that Sarah was not my biological daughter. I adored her and wanted her to grow up with me. Sheila's father ensured that this did not happen. He handled the divorce for her, and I received nothing. I do not have a job. I do not have a home. I do not have a wife. I don't have my daughter. And I have to pay her for child support that is not mine. I don't mind supporting Sarah, but I only get to see her one weekend a month. And that is killing me. I have nothing. I was so screwed by the divorce that I just had to leave and figure out how to start again. I'm not sure if I can start over. I just have to think things out. That is why I am here. Did you speak with your wife after you filed for divorce? No. I had a restraining order that prevented me from coming within 1,000 feet of Sheila and Sarah. I was dismissed from my job and evicted from my home. As I already stated, her father owned everything and everyone in town, so there was nothing I could do. And she never attended any of the hearings. Her father and lawyers handled everything, if they have taken everything from you. How did you arrive here? My mother had saved some money and given it to me so I could get out of town. It was intended to supplement their income in old life. My father couldn't work anymore, and he has a disability retirement pension, so they should be fine. But that's it. They'll be okay. Not as good as they had planned. Now they'll be able to live. And that's it. I would like to repay them, but I am not sure if it will be possible. My mind was filled with memories that kept spinning. I felt tense. I felt low again. Every time I thought about my life, I became so depressed that I could not think clearly. Anna somehow sensed my dismal mood and thankfully shifted the conversation. My story is very similar. I, too, hailed from the poorer part of town. My mother and father traveled from Mexico with my older brother and sister. I was born here. We resided on the Mexican side of Plano, Texas. It was not a particularly pleasant environment. My father left when I was eight years old, and my mother cleaned houses for a wealthy family across town. My brother joined the army and was slain in Iraq. My sister married a grocer and now lives in San Antonio with three children of her own. I married a man whom I met at a friend's wedding. Logan worked for a local car parts manufacturing. When I initially met him, he was a new salesperson for the company, but today he is a senior sales representative. We dated for a while, and he was nice and gentle always treating me like a princess. We didn't have much money, so after we got married, we went on our honeymoon to a nearby resort hotel. It was fantastic. I thought everything was fine. I loved him, and he loved me. I'd recently graduated culinary school and was seeking for my first job as a cook when he informed me he did not want his wife to work. He felt inferior since his wife worked. I wasn't happy about it, but I remained at home. Our marriage gradually deteriorated. He began as polite and considerate, but after a few years, he became demanding and abusive. I stayed with him and endured his abuse for a few more years. Something happened one day that prompted me to pause and reflect on our marriage. I was no longer a princess. I was not pleased. I was in danger. Things happened that I despised, and I just needed to get away. So one day, when searching the internet for a place to go, I came across Duke's webpage. 
The next day, I took out all of our savings from the bank, sold my car and wedding ring, and came here. I have barely been gone two weeks. Sometimes I'm terrified Logan will find me and come here once I run out of money. I am not sure what I am going to do or where I am going. I could stay with my sister, but I'd just be another mouth to feed. Logan would find me there eventually. Before I depart, I want to plan where I'm going and what I'm going to do. All I can do is hope. Annabella. Do people call you Anna? What shall I call you? I like Anna. Well, Anna, we're in the same boat. We recently fled a horrible relationship and have no idea what the future holds. All I can say is that I have a little money. And if you need help staying here and figuring out your future, I'll be happy to assist in any way I can. We can wait and see how things go. But remember the offer. That is kind, but I do not want to take anything from you. You have your own troubles, and you will need all of your money. But thank you. I am lost in thinking, looking out over the lake. And the conversation has ended. I looked across to Anna, who was also looking out over the lake and had stopped crying. Our extended silence was broken by a large fish jumping out of the water only a few feet from the dock. We exchanged glances and smiles, and Duke believes he knows where the best fishing spots are. She replied with a small laugh. This improved both of our moods. We soon started talking about our college days. Anna finds Penn State intriguing, even when I attempt to make it sound boring. Culinary school sounds intriguing to me because I enjoy eating. As we talked, we became more at ease with each other. Our discourse led to our childhood dreams. We discussed our dogs and pals. We sat and spoke until the sun was directly overhead and the ocean was perfectly calm. It like a mirror reflecting upside-down mountains from the opposite coast. God, I adore this location. Leo, I'm going back to my cabin for a while. I'm going to have a nap. If you like, I'll bring a pot of soup over tonight so we can sit on your porch and talk some more. I truly like your company. Is that okay? She stood and ran her fingertips along the back of my hand. The reaction in my body was both surprising and delightful. I'd love it. I truly love talking to you as well. I'm going to stay here for a while. You go ahead and up. As she went, I turned to watch her walk up the dirt path. I was still startled and excited by the stunning sight of her walking away. I glanced at her as she walked away, thinking that everything was suddenly possible. I looked around to see a couple of geese flying over the lake. Before I knew it, I was fast asleep in the ancient rocking chair. Knock, knock, is anybody home? Anna spoke via the screen door. Hey, let me help you out there. Place that on the table and I'll see if I can find some bowls. I'm sorry I can't offer you a nice wine, but I neglected to carry a couple bottles. Perhaps we can include a couple when Duke goes on a supply run. We each fixed a bowl of another of her concoctions and walked to the patio to eat once we finished our empty bowls. Actually, after two helpings, I reclined back and rested my heels on the porch railing, hands behind my head. She looked across at me, stretched out and relaxed, and added, Just like a man and a dog, a full stomach. And now all you want to do is stretch out and fall asleep. Where did you learn how to cook like that? We had a housekeeper who cooked for us, but she never prepared anything as remarkable as this. It was wonderful. Thank you. I adore cooking and had an excellent teacher in school. He explained that at one point in his life he was unemployed and had to eat whatever he could find. He occasionally retrieved leftover food from restaurant dumpsters and prepared soup or stew with it. He named it Heaven Provides Soup. My mom used to call it hobo stew, whatever you call it. It works. I simply took his notion of combining whatever you had and arranging it in an enjoyable manner. I'm happy you liked it. We sat silently for a while, gazing at the lake. A squirrel dashed out of the brush and halted only a few feet in front of us. As soon as it stopped, another sprang out and pursued the first. They rushed around and around, chasing each other until they both vanished into the brush. I always love a little after-dinner entertainment, I explained. She simply grinned. Leo, you stated that your marriage ended after you learned about your daughter's father. What do you mean by that? Before I began, I took a deep breath and thoroughly exhaled. I was married to Sheila for five years, and I had no idea she had a hidden boyfriend. Perhaps I was too foolish to notice the clues. I'm not sure why I didn't know, but I did not. When I received the DNA test results, I came to the only conclusion I could. Sheila was having an affair. I did not want to believe it. Hell, I couldn't believe it. But all of the proof was present. 
So I asked a college acquaintance, can Houghton help? He works as a private investigator in Washington, D.C., and has a team capable of finding out almost anything. He discovered the identify of Sheila's lover. He had images and recordings of them in bed together, and he discovered evidence that they had been dating since she was in college. How could I suppose that my wife would be unfaithful to me? I needed to see for myself. I watched the video and was really blown away. I watched my life and marriage crumble in front of my eyes on that TV display. I felt heartbroken and sick. I cried. I battered the walls. I wanted to die. I wanted to kill someone. I spent several hours riding my motorcycle, reflecting on what I observed and what I should do about it. I could only find one solution. Obtain a divorce. I'm so sorry. That must have been terrible for you. It's insane that someone could live two lives and not expect to be discovered. What she did to you deserves to be punished. Oh my God, what a bitch. Oops, I'm sorry. Sometimes it simply comes out. I understand a little Spanish. That final bit is completely correct. I've said the same things myself, but I'm not sure if I desire payback. Right now, all I want is to go as far away from her and her overbearing father as possible. I am still thinking. Anna took the dishes back to the cottage. When she returned, I turned to hide the tears in my eyes and wiped my face before she noticed me. I believe she saw it anyway. You know, Anna, just talking about the whole thing makes me hurt all over again. I adored Sheila and can't understand how she could betray me like Way. You realize how awful it is to discover that the person you loved is not who you thought they were. I could see in her eyes that she was all too familiar with the suffering I was conveying. I placed my hand on hers and she began to speak. Leo, I told you this afternoon that I am comfortable talking to you. I understand that we've only known each other for a short time, but I want to be as open with you as you have been with me. Please understand that part of what I'm about to tell you is difficult for me. It's quite intimate. I'm not sure if I can even utter these things out loud. Please have patience with me. I said, simply talk and don't worry about me. I will not interrupt. I will be patient, and I do not want you to do or say anything that could harm you. Okay, here goes. I told you that my marriage began nicely, but eventually devolved into a nightmare. My initial signals of problems were subtle. I didn't think much of it because I adored my spouse and wanted to satisfy him. When we first married, our sex life was fantastic. We made love with passion, and only on occasion did we have sex for enjoyment. We didn't do anything strange. Logan expressed a desire to experiment a few months after we married. I wasn't sure what he meant, but I liked and trusted him, so I said all right. We were making love one weekend when he suddenly became a little rough. He began pushing me and twisting my skin with his fingers, leaving marks all over me. He rolled me over and grabbed me from behind. It was the first time I'd had sex like that, and it hurt a lot. I was bleeding somewhat when he finished. He simply smiled at me and stated that I was a nice wife. He stated he wanted more. And what he did over the next few weeks was downright horrible. He would spank, slap, and squeeze me until I was crying. He used various toys on me, which hurt a lot, but the more it hurt, the more he liked it. He became enraged the more I yelled and begged him to stop. I recall one time when I was sick with the flu or something, and he urged me to get into bed and prepare for him. I said that I was sick and couldn't. He grabbed me, yanked my clothing off, and began slapping me till I fell to the floor, weeping. He dragged me to the bed and tied me to it face down. He began to chuckle and whacked me on the bottom and rear of my legs with a stick. The more I protested and begged, the louder he laughed and hit me. I screamed for him to stop, but all he did was put a pillowcase over my lips so he couldn't hear me. He struck me repeatedly till I blacked out. When I awoke, I was untied, but in a lot of pain. I was so upset and hurt that I couldn't sit down because my bottom hurt so severely I could barely walk. He was passed out on the couch in the main room. He had passed out drunk. I didn't realize he was drinking because he did it outside the house and in the car. Soon he was drinking constantly, including at home. I attempted to avoid him when he did. Another occasion, he returned home from an afternoon of drinking with some of his pals and was upset that supper was not on the table when he went in. It was the first time he hit me with his fist. He smacked me in the stomach, and I collapsed on the floor, struggling to regain my breath. When I tried to stand up, he kept shoving me back down with his foot while laughing, so I stayed on the floor, crying. He went over to the couch and passed out. I didn't know what to do, so I dashed into the kitchen and hurriedly prepared his meal, setting it on the table. I awoke him and informed him that his food was ready. 
He simply slapped me across the face. I tumbled backwards across the coffee table, landing on my back. He got up and went into the kitchen and I heard plates smash. Some of them crashed into the living room. I tried to flee into the bedroom and lock the door, but he caught me and began hitting me again. I was practically unconscious. I don't remember what happened after that. I woke up in bed, with him crying next to me. He apologized. He harmed me, and it would not happen again. He promised. I was bruised all over. This time, there was so much blood that the blankets where I lay were wet. I stated I needed to go to the hospital, but he refused. He did not want anyone to know what he had done. It took me two days to get out of bed again, and even then, I could only see through one eye. I was alone when he went to work, and when he got home, he just cried and apologized. I adore this man. How could he have injured me so badly? He stated that he was going to stop drinking. I listened to him scream and blamed everything on his excessive drinking. I believed him, so I did not tell anyone about what he'd done. I assumed it wouldn't happen again. He stopped drinking and things returned to normal for a few months. He came home one day from work and informed me he had found a digital camera in the parking lot at work. It was a pretty expensive-looking camera and I didn't believe him, but I said nothing. He urged me to go get dressed in my best outfit so that we could go out. When I finished dressing, he entered the bedroom and informed me that we would not be going out. He instructed me to sit on the bed. He began shooting photos of me with the new camera. I wasn't bothered because he was smiling and paying attention to me again. I began to feel like a princess again. He instructed me to stand up and undress. I knew he wanted to photograph me without my clothes on, and I didn't want to upset him, so I did. He was directing me how to position and what I should do with my hands. I claimed I did not want to. He gave me the same expression he had when he was drunk, and then he started ranting. He called me many different names while photographing me. I was crying, and he was still taking shots. He removed his belt and threatened that if I did not pose nicely for him, he would turn me over and beat my bottom, so I complied. He kept taking photographs. When he was finished, he threatened that if I did not do this, he would print out the images and distribute them to all of my friends and neighbors whenever he wanted. I did not desire that. So I posed for him, danced for him, and stripped when he asked me to. He alternated between taking pictures and simply watching. Then he took me. Every time was difficult. I did whatever he asked because I did not want to be hit again. He arrived home one day, inebriated, but I couldn't smell alcohol on him. I assume he'd been smoking something. He grabbed his camera and ordered I strip for him, which I did. He asked me to perform some crazy things, but I declined. That's when he struck me with the camera. My eyes filled with blood and I began to scream. I believe one of our neighbors heard me scream when someone knocked on the front door. He instructed me to grab a towel and clean up my face. He answered the door and informed whoever was present that I had fallen and injured myself. He walked into the kitchen, took out a butcher knife from the drawer, and threatened to cut me if I told anyone about what he'd done. I was so afraid that I just cried and promised him I wouldn't tell anyone. He entered the living room and passed out on the couch. He returned home drunk a few more times and threatened me with a knife. And I did what he told me. I was so afraid. I didn't think about anything other than what he told me to do. I just wasn't sure what to do. Jesus Christ, I believed my life was a disaster. This little beauty has suffered maltreatment. Shit is not the correct word. She was tortured by a drug-crazed madman. I wasn't sure what to think. I was starting to shiver. I was very angry. I wanted to kill someone again. When I stared at this delicate flower, I felt tears spring up in my eyes. I wanted to grab her in my arms and tell her that everything would be fine. I longed to hold her. I didn't know her well enough to do that. Instead, I said nothing and didn't move. I simply trembled all over. Leo, are you okay? Please say anything. Leo. After a time, I looked up at her and exclaimed, My God, that's awful. That is the most awful thing I have ever heard. I cannot understand how you felt. I'm so sorry. Oh, my God. She rose from her chair, approached me, and placed her hand on mine. She gently withdrew the stiff hand from my breast and placed it on her cheek. She smiled. My tension began to ease and my shaking subsided slightly. She whispered softly, Thank you. You have no idea how fantastic that makes me feel. We just kept holding hands for a long time. I believe I'd best take what's left of the soup and return to my cabin. She remarked as she placed my hand on the armrest. I'll see you for breakfast. 
When she left, all I could think about was her and her awful, abusive husband. I finally decided I needed to go to bed. Because of the pictures she conjured up in my mind, I had a difficult time falling asleep. Along with the visions of my wife and her lover, I now had more dreadful thoughts. However, these were distinct. These showed an innocent young woman being tortured, and all I wanted to do was come to her aid. A fitful sleep eventually led to blackouts. My thoughts. Dew poured the coffee and observed. Someone seems to have had a bad night. He's correct. When I looked in the mirror this morning, I saw only bloodshot eyes and drooping shoulders. Have any aspirin? Look what I can find. I took a large sip of coffee and gazed around the room. The two other lodgers were just finishing up their breakfast as I nodded hello to them. Anna was nowhere to be seen. Duke reappeared with a bottle of aspirin and placed it next to my coffee. This high alpine air will deceive you. It doesn't take long to get that headache because the oxygen is slightly thinner up here. Take it easy for a few days so your system can adjust. Why not go out on the lake today? I'll get you one of the boats so you can see how good of a fisherman you are. Good morning, Duke, anarchist. The old gentleman's cheek causing him to blush. Isn't this a gorgeous morning? Ask a friend here. He looks as if the bear slept with him last night. Duke refilled his coffee cup. She eventually took a close look at me and said, Good God, you look terrible. What happened? Duke said, The thin mountain air caught up with me. He will be well in a few days. He headed back to the kitchen with the coffee kettle. Are you going to be okay? She asked. Yeah, as soon as the room stops pulsating. I will be all right. Duke recommended a day on the lake. I may take him up on it. I haven't gone fishing since I was a youngster. Perhaps you should not go out alone. I don't know how to fish, but I can keep you company. That may be wonderful. Got any sunblock? I will see what Duke has. We sat calmly while Duke ate his customary breakfast of eggs, bacon, bread, orange juice, and coffee. I had a side order of aspirin. You appear delighted this morning. Was the old preacher's suggestion effective? Confession is beneficial for the soul. Perhaps it did. I do feel a little more relaxed. Perhaps talking a friend about your problems has some value. You are my friend, right? I did pour a lot of heavy stuff on you yesterday. Everything is okay now. I can handle being macho and all that. And yeah, I am your friend. As we exited the lodge after breakfast, we heard Duke yell behind us, I'll put one of the little boats in the water near the dock. Take it out whenever you want. Thank you, Duke. Anna held my hand, and we walked together back to our cabins. Around ten o'clock, I met Anna on the dock. She wore a white, long-sleeved man's shirt and blue pants. She now wore tennis shoes and a white baseball cap. Her hair was tied back into a ponytail for a woman dressed in regular, scruffy attire. She looked stunning. It could have been due to the large smile on her face as she noticed me approaching. I haven't had many gorgeous women smile at me recently. I found some sunscreen. Duke has a supply cabinet in the back room that has everything. How are you feeling right now? Better. The headache is manageable. Maybe a day at the lake with you is exactly what I need. She grinned as I answered. With you. She has a beautiful smile. It took a few minutes to find out how to start the engine and get moving. We drove around for a bit before turning off the motor in a location where we could see both sides of the lake at once. The mountains that encircled us dwarfed our small boat, and the lodge seemed like a postage stamp from where we were. I looked around and noticed that Duke had prepared everything for us. The poles were ready, and there was a small box containing some bait that resembled small dough balls. At the very least, let us appear to be knowledgeable. I continued. I put a dough ball on one of the hooks and handed the rod to Anna, who dropped the line over the side. On the other pole, I left the spoon in place and lowered the line into the water. She watched me and imitated what I did with the rod at the opposite end of the small boat. She tentatively took the rod and reel and said, Now what do I do? Just wait, I advised, and be patient. We sat there for a few minutes before Anna remarked to me, Leo, I didn't think about what I was doing yesterday when I told you my story. Well, that's part of my narrative. I did not tell you everything. You were tense while listening, and I believe I may have added my troubles to yours. I didn't consider that, and I apologize. If it causes you pain, we don't have to discuss it anymore. But to be honest, I feel better after telling you and being genuine with you, Anna. I dreamed about what you told me. I thought about how brutalized you were. Looking at you now, 
I can't see someone wanting to do that to you. You're so delicate, kind, and attractive. How could someone attempt to destroy that? That is horrible. Did you just call me beautiful? Yes, you are gorgeous. When I look at you, I see a gorgeous woman. Any reasonable man would. But that's only the outside. I can only see a small portion of what's inside. But I do very little. See also looks lovely. And very frail. Thank you. I have not been called gorgeous in a long time. There are many foolish people in the world. Thank you for not being one of them. The rod jerks downward abruptly. What was that? That is a nibble. Hold on to the rod, but not too tightly. Wait to see what occurs. We sat silently for a time, gazing at her rod. Nothing happened for a very long period. Relax. He's gone, I said. Anna looked from the rod to Leo. May I tell you something? Sure, anything. You make me feel like a princess. You are a princess. She smiled at me and said, Thanks. We relaxed and glanced around, admiring the breathtaking view of the mountains and sky. After a while, our gazes met. She smiled warmly at me. I grinned back, thinking that the beautiful vista had just gotten a lot better. She scooted over to sit next to me, placing her hand on mine and her head on my shoulder. We sat there for a long time, staring out over the lake and down at Roger. Hey, our friends are back. I said... I took her rod and placed it in her hands. As soon as she seized the tip, she jerked violently downward. Then I remarked, hold on. I believe we are going to have a visitor pull up on the rod and reel it in a few feet. The rod started to bend, tug, and tremble violently. I do not know what to do. Help me, Leo. Simply grasp the rod tightly and place the back end in your hip. Take the other hand and begin reeling in, slowly, tentatively. She did what I said. The rod was bucking and pulling, but she kept hold of it while reeling. Finally, a large splash erupted a few feet from the boat as the fish breached the water. Holy stuff! Keep reeling! Simply keep reeling! I will obtain the internet! I grabbed the net and gazed over the side into the lake. As I plunged down into the water, I pulled out what every fisherman dreams of. A massive lake trout. Ha ha ha! Look what you have! This bad boy is enormous! He's a beauty! All Anna could do was stare wide-eyed. I know what we'll be eating for supper tonight. You called it soup. Heaven provides generously, honey. Heaven just served dinner. I took the line with the fish, transferred everything to the cooler, and placed our food inside. Wait until Duke sees this. He'll fall over. Anna was still in astonishment. Almost immediately, she leaped up and threw her arms around my neck, letting out a gleeful scream while rocking the boat. Whoa there. Sit down. We do not want to go swimming just yet. She let go and sat down, feeling foolish. Sorry. It's only that I had never caught a fish before. So let's see if he has any family down there. I baited the hook and released it over the side. I sat beside her and placed my arm around her shoulder. She smiled the widest she could, rested her head on my shoulder, and wrapped her arms around my chest. Thank you, she replied. For what? Thank you for making me happy again. Thank you. She clutched my chest for a long time. Everything was quiet and peaceful on the lake. It was so calm that I thought I could hear her heartbeat. I turned my head and kissed the top of her head before resting my cheek on her ebony hair. We were both at peace for the first time in a long time. Holy mother of God. Where did you obtain those? Duke yelled as I took the fish out of the cooler. I've been searching for him for years. Well, the small lady grabbed him and exclaimed, I had no idea what I was doing. Leo just guided me after he got hooked. Did I do well, tiny lady? That is a record. Trout are found in this lake. I bet he weighs 40 pounds or more. We need to get the camera before we fillet him. You two are going on the bulletin board. We all come up to the lodge, smiling and talking about the one that didn't get away, and I catch him. Duke went inside, grabbed his camera, and instructed her to pose on the porch with her gift and the lake in the background. We grinned as we looked at the pictures he shot. Yes, Irie, you two are going to eat well tonight. I'll grab him and get him prepared. You'll be here at six o'clock for dinner. My reward. Anna and I strolled back to our cabin, smiling and holding hands. All of our concerns were temporarily forgotten. A lake trout made our lives easier. When we arrived at my cabin, I turned around and placed my hands around her waist. We just stood there for a time, with the mountains framing the shot.
before I drew her close and slowly lowered my lips to hers. Leo, I am unable to. She pulled back. I looked down at the ground and began shaking my arms. I... Oh God, I apologize. I cannot. Please calm down. What is wrong? I lifted her chin and looked into her eyes. I apologize. I suddenly had a flashback to before and became afraid. He hurt me. I guess he hurt me more than I realized. I understand you wouldn't, but it's simply... I understand. I should not have pushed you. No, it is not you. It's me. When you kissed me, it brought back terrible memories of Logan punching me and having hard sex. Your lips just activated it. I'm so sorry. That is okay. I will be here when you are ready. I am not going to do anything to harm you. You are aware of this. I understand. Please, just hold me. We stood there embracing for an eternity. Her shaking calmed down after a while. She seemed quiet, and I could feel her breathing more gently against my chest. She appeared weak in my arms, so delicate and little. I will keep her forever, if necessary, until her last devil was gone. The sound of a bird chirping nearby disrupts the silence of the woods. We turned to look, but it was gone. When we turned back, I noticed her lovely dark eyes smiling at me. Then her lips form a smile to match. Thank you. Those were the most wonderful words I had heard all day. Anna went softly to close the distance between our faces. Her eyes met mine as she carefully moved her lips to lightly meet mine. There was almost no touch. It felt so delicate before she pulled back and grinned even more broadly. Time seemed to stop as she peered into my eyes and smiled again. She moved to kiss me, but this time her contact was more intentional. We parted with a delicate and silent kiss. We both grinned and gazed into one another's eyes. I said, there's nothing like a first kiss. Nothing will ever be more sensitive or full of promise. Everybody has a few in their lifetime. Nothing beats this except for the second kiss. I approached again, kissing her lips. This time our kiss lasted longer and went deeper. If our minds were not so preoccupied with our kiss, we would have felt our hearts beat together. Tap, tap. Hello? Is anyone home? I asked. Hello, self. Come in. I'm almost ready. His voice came from behind the restroom door. And you mention guys and their cliché routines. Do what you need to do. I will wait. After all, who am I to complain? I entered into the small hut and stood. There. Is Anna finished with her face in the bathroom? I watched her do her cosmetics and grinned. You are gorgeous. I said. She is gorgeous. She was wearing a lovely yellow print top that hugged her figure in all the right ways. Not too tight, but just perfect. And the hue caused her face to light up. The jeans have been replaced by a black skirt that ends at the knees with sandals on the feet below. Her hair was in a ponytail again, but this time from the side of her head, not the back. She turned to me and extended her hands. Now I'm gorgeous. Let's go eat. I'm starving. Not quite yet. Not until I have messed up some of the makeup. I went in to kiss her, but she pulled back, saying, No, no, not now. Later. First, we eat. She took my hand and walked me out of the hut down the hill. As we walked to the lodge, Anna spoke. You look good. Who would have expected to bring a blazer to a fishing lodge? She kissed my hand and intertwined her fingers with mine as we went. Right this way, to your table. Duke made an exaggerated bow as we entered the dining area. Your dinner is waiting. I moved her chair out and Anna sat. Duke draped a white cloth napkin on her lap, then placed one over mine. He went to the kitchen, leaving us alone in the room. We sat silently and looked into one other's eyes. Anna broke the stillness, saying, I love Duke. He is such a gentleman. He was probably a ladies' man when he was younger. His wife must have been very pleased. Duke returned, carrying two dishes of trout and vegetables. He said my wife was the reason I left after meeting her. I never looked at another woman afterward. She was my first and only love. We've been together for 30 years, 30 lovely years. Her ashes are located on the hill, just behind your cabins, behind that small park seat. He placed the dishes in front of us and remarked, Bon appétit, and turned away, leaving us to enjoy our supper and each other. The lunch goes by too soon. At the end, Duke pulls out a pear half drizzled with chocolate sauce. Just leave everything here when you're finished. I'll get to it tomorrow. I'm about to go to bed. Good night to you two. After the simple dessert, 
we sat holding hands and gazing into each other's eyes. Anna stated that this has been a fantastic day. Thank you for sharing this with me. It is not over yet. We can stay up tonight and check if there is an aurora. I'd like to do some stargazing with you. How about that? Sounds like the great way to spend the day in the highlands, away from the city lights. The stars overhead are beyond description. You can see what looks to be a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy. We were both unfamiliar with such a spectacle because we had grown up in cities where the ground lights drowned out the stars. But tonight, the sky is ablaze with stars. However, there is no aurora borealis tonight, perhaps tomorrow. We sat in front of my cabin on two rickety old rockers, looking up into the sky and holding hands. An owl hooted sometimes, and crickets chirped, but there were no other sounds. Not even the wind blows to one side. There is a loud crack. We both turned to gaze in that way, but everything was black and we couldn't see anything. Another crack, followed by another from the same direction. Then came a rustling sound from the bushes. I guess we have a guest. I suggested we make a discreet getaway until he leaves. A good idea. I don't want to end my great day by becoming a bear's food. We both silently get up and walk backwards into the cabin, closing the door. So what should we do now? I asked. I can think of something, she remarked as she covertly studied the bed. I caught her in my arms and kissed her as if it were our last. It's powerful and deep, yet not too much for the petite woman. She kissed me back. We made love. Once finished, we lay panting next to each other for quite some time before either of us dared to move, lest we disrupt the other's bliss. I moved my head to look at her and noticed that her face was turned aside. She seemed to be crying. Anna, what is wrong? Are you okay? I asked. She returned her gaze to mine, showing me the tears pouring down her cheeks and replied gently. Hello? There's nothing wrong. Everything is correct. Exactly right. I haven't felt this way in a very long time. I'm not referring to the sex, which was wonderful. I mean the sense of being adored. You always love me. We were making love. I could feel it. I hope you can too. It was amazing. Oleo, everything is perfect. Phew. I thought for a moment. I was losing contact. She smacked my back with a smile on her face and shouted, No! Funny man, you haven't lost touch. I really enjoy your touch. Just don't laugh about it. Please hold me. We rotated our bodies to face one other and put our arms around one another. I nuzzled her neck and anarchized my ears. We stayed like this till we fell asleep in each other's arms. As the morning crept over the mountains through a slow, steady rain, I became aware of the bed and the warm body in my arms. The soft pitter-patter of the roof echoed around the little room. We didn't see the light of day or hear the rain on the roof. We could hear one other's heartbeat as we lay there in a warm morning hug. Good morning. Good morning, my darling wife. Would you like to forego breakfast and stay in bed all day? That sounds great to me. As long as you're willing to gamble on that, just let me finish my beer and I'll be back to keep you warm and safe the rest of the day. I got up and went to the bathroom. Anna remained in bed, watching at me as I went about my morning routine. I could only image what she was considering. It surprised me, yet I felt like I had always known her. But in actuality, it has only been a few days. I returned to the bed and said, Your turn. Anna got up and closed the door as she entered. Now I'm lying there thinking about Anna, and I'm starting to become aroused. I covered myself up and tried to appear unconcerned. When Anna returned, she giggled at the protruding bedding and dived under the covers alongside me. We just stayed there, clutching each other and becoming aware of the pitter-patter on the roof. Leo, don't take this the wrong way, and you're not required to respond, but I have something to say. I believe I adore you. I know it's weird because we've only known each other for a few days, but I feel like I've known you forever. I'm at ease around you and feel protected in your arms. Wow, I can't think of anything else. Wow. Maybe it's ridiculous, but I've never felt better in my arms than I do with you. Right now, I want to concentrate solely on you and forget about the mess I just left Anna. Honestly, I could feel that way about you. But I can't think about loving you while I'm dealing with a serious problem. I do not want to hurt you. I want you to be happy, and if you are already, that is all I care about. I'm not concerned about anything or anyone else right now. I care just about you, right now. Stop thinking and hold me. Anna and I stayed in bed all day, talking and kissing. We made love twice more, exactly like the first. Gently, gently. 
we forgot to leave the cabin and eat. The rain stopped the next day, but everything remained soggy and muddy as we headed to breakfast. I missed you yesterday. What have you done? Stay in your bed and listen to the rain, Duke replied with a knowing smile. That is something both my lawyer and I used to do. We had several rather exhausting wet days. Yes, something like that, I admitted, smiling as I exited. Anna, please listen. Today's Tuesday supply flight arrives at noon. Nobody is scheduled to accompany him, so you'll be the sole guests after the other two go today. If you have any special requests for meals, please leave a message and I will include it in their next delivery. We need to arrange ahead of time because the plane only arrives on Tuesdays and Fridays. Can we fit anything in? I asked. Yes, almost anything that can be purchased at a supermarket, liquor store, or hardware store. Is there anything else you might have to wait a while for? But you can place an order for anything, at any moment. She grinned and nibbled into her toast. The same float plane that flew me in a few days before arrived around lunchtime, loaded with boxes of supplies, mostly food. We helped Duke unpack the items and place them in the pantry, while the two fishermen carried their luggage to the plane for their return trip. Everyone worked quietly and effectively. Duke sat down with us after the plane took off and explained how the resort operates. He's been doing everything on his own for the past 20 years and only his late wife knew how. Duke is a comical old buzzard. He informed us about the winters and how everything is entirely isolated for two or three months as the lake almost fully freezes. Sometimes the snow is so deep that he can't get from the lodge to the pier. The float aircraft delivery service is discontinued, so he must plan for everything he will require in the interim. He occasionally goes hunting for new meat, but it doesn't last all winter. The loneliness is the worst aspect of spending time at the lake during the winter. Now that my Louise was gone, he admitted, and I'm getting older and don't have any children to leave this home to when I die. But I don't plan to die anytime soon. The three of us spent the majority of the day talking about the mountains, the lake, fishing, hunting, horrible winters, and nice people. The discourse never strayed from the reason why the two immigrants were hiding out with old Duke. After a day of nice talk, Anna asked us to stay at the dinner table since she wanted to go make stew for dinner. I want to, and I will not accept no as an answer. She disappeared into the kitchen and shut the door. Duke said, I like that gal, but there is something tragic about her. She appears to have perked up since you arrived, though. I hope you two hit it off. She deserves to be happy. Duke, I really like her, too. I have my own problems and don't want them to harm her. I'm going to take it slowly, and perhaps we can both make each other happy for a while. I swear not to injure her, so don't worry, I am cool. Anna soon appeared, carrying a big tureen filled with hot veggies and fish. Duke, I call this my heaven-provided stew. I hope you enjoyed it. She dashed back inside and grabbed the iced tea and biscuits before settling down to eat. After a few bites, Duke leaned back and murmured, This reminds me a lot of a stew my Louisa made. She named it fish chowder. It much outperforms anything I could create. Oops, sorry for my vulgarity, but it's fantastic, thanks. We all ate quietly, save for the occasional slurping noise. Hello, Leo, it's me. Can I come inside? Anna murmured through the door. I opened the door and said, Hi there, good looking. I was just thinking of you. What brings you out at this time of night? I was thinking about you, too. My cottage is way over there, whereas yours is way over here. Can we just put everything together and be one? They claim that two people can live on the same budget as one. Duke is already aware of the situation and appears to be fine with it. How about that? Can I come inside? Of course. You shouldn't return tonight in case that bear is prowling around. I just found you. I do not want to lose you. She nestled next to me in bed, pressing her body against mine and wrapping her arms around my neck. Leo, if you don't want to respond, I completely understand. However, you mentioned that your wife had a partner that you were unaware of. You mentioned that it disgusted you. How could you stay with her after finding out? I don't know. I just avoided her whenever I saw her. All I could think about was what I watched on tape. Every time I wanted to strangle her. I truly wanted to be with Sarah. If being with Sarah required me to stay with that deceitful lady for an extended period of time, I had no choice. From the moment I found out to the day I filed for divorce, I avoid her like the plague. I found extra projects to do around the house or at my parents, and I took Sarah to the park and playground whenever possible. 
All I wanted to do was locate an attorney and get out of there. When the papers were served, everything burst. Her father became involved, and my difficulties only grew worse. I've previously told you what occurred, but I was eventually beaten to the ground. The worst thing cannot be discussed. It's simply so awful. I threw up after finding out. Even now, thinking about it makes me ill. That was the deal breaker. I realized immediately away that I needed to move away from her and her family. Then don't discuss it. Do not even think about it. I cannot imagine anything worse than what you have already told me. Come here and hold me. Don't think about her anymore. I'll help make things better. We slept there for a long time, embracing each other silently. I lifted my head from her shoulder and gazed into her dark eyes. Thank you for being here. I whispered this before my lips touched hers. Our kiss was delicate and loving, and it reminded me that there are still nice people in the world. The black-haired beauty in my arms is one of them. Our lips separated and I lowered my head back onto her shoulders. Leo, she whispered, I can tell you more about my story than I could the other day. I believe I can now. I want to because I believe that doing so will help me overcome some of my own demons. As your pastor said, confession is beneficial for the soul. Believe it or not, this is what I have to say. Worse than what I already told you. Can you bear to hear it? Anything for you. After that, I may want to kill someone, but I will listen to whatever you have to say. So this happened following what I told you the other day. Remember when I said Logan threatened me with a knife and demanded I do everything he said? So one day, he came home high on whatever he was smoking and told me to get dressed up because he had a surprise for me. I went into my bedroom, showered and dressed into one of my prettiest clothes. When I finished, I went into the living room where Logan was sitting and talking to a woman. He gave me an odd smile before introducing me to her. She was his boss at work. Her name was Faye, something. She was a large woman, not overweight, but tall and powerful with short blonde hair. I thought she was pretty until she spoke. She spoke in a somber voice and used a lot of swear words. She just sat next to Logan, smiling at me. Logan mentioned that he was displaying my images around at work, and Faye thought I was attractive and expressed her desire to meet me. I didn't realize it at the time, but the photographs he was exhibiting were of me taken with his new camera when I was naked and doing various things. Anyway, Logan had brought Faye home to meet me. He told me that it was crucial to him to make Faye happy, so I was supposed to entertain her that evening. I had no idea what he wanted me to do, so I just stood there and looked at the two of them. He said something like, I will explain it to you so you understand. You will do anything Faye wants, and I will sit and watch. You have to keep her satisfied, so I'm pleased that if you do not do what she wants or hesitate for a moment, you will be punished. Do you understand what I mean? I simply stood there startled. I wasn't sure what to do. Faye rose up from the couch and approached me, standing about an arm's length away. She just stood there, smiling at me. Then she strolled by me and into the kitchen, where she grabbed two beers from the refrigerator before returning to the couch and sitting next Logan. She grinned at me while standing there and instructed me to strip for them. I wasn't sure what to do. I felt afraid. If I went away, Logan would become enraged and hit me. I wasn't sure what to do, so I began to undress. Faye instructed me to put some music on the radio and strip to it. I did my best to dance along with the music. All the time. They sat together and watched. When I was done, Faye stood up, approached me, and began touching me. I was so afraid that I was shaking. She wrapped her arms around me and kissed me. I have never kissed a woman before. I wasn't sure what to do. I started crying. Logan became enraged and began yelling when he noticed that I was weeping. Faye only stared as he raged at me. Then he grabbed my arm, hauled me into the bedroom, and threw me onto the bed. Faye followed us and stood over me next to the bed. Logan sat on the foot of the bed and told Faye, She's all yours. Faye began undressing next to me. I looked at Logan, who was simply sitting there smiling and observing both of us. She did awful things to me. I just laid there feeling disgusted. I'd never had intercourse with another woman, let alone while my spouse watched. She got up, dressed, and started talking to Logan while I lay there. I overheard her remark that she wanted to come over again. Logan promised to make sure I was accessible to her whenever she wanted. When I heard that, I buried my head in the pillow and cried. Logan came to bed after she left and forced me to have sex with him, and he was as harsh as usual. After he finished, he told me about his plans. 
He mentioned that his boss enjoyed my company and wanted to come over again. He said he would let her if she offered him a specific customer's account at work. She said she would. He also told me that he'd been giving my photos to his co-workers, and they liked what they saw. He told me that from now on, I'd have to be ready when he called to entertain his friends, co-workers, and customers and do anything they asked. He told me that he had previously planned for me to attend a party with some of his drinking buddies the next weekend. He told me to be as polite to them as I was to his boss. They were paying him $500 for me over the weekend. Then he told me he had other intentions. I was also planning to attend the company manager's meeting the next month and be available for everyone to have sex with all week. He was going to make a lot of money both for me and at work. He was to be given responsibility for more important accounts. Leo intended to promote me to his co-workers and acquaintances. When he said that, I realized I needed to go. So the next day, I ran away. I watched as she fell silent and glanced into the distance. Her face began to distort and her eyes filled with tears. Oh, God, I can't go on. Her entire body shook as she sobbed heartbreakingly. I took her into my arms and hugged her passionately. Everything is all right now. You are safe and away from those folks. You're with me now. I will take care of you. I will love you. I whispered the words in her ear. She continued to cry, and the tears streamed down her cheeks and onto my shoulder. Her sobs subsided, leaving only the repetitive sound of her breathing. She screamed and fell asleep in my arms. When I awoke, Anna was sitting naked, cross-legged on the bed, looking at me. Morning was all I said. Did you say you loved me last night? She asked. Yes, I believe I did. What you told me last night was terrible. You didn't do anything to deserve such harshness. And I will see to it that you never have to go through anything like that again. The only way I can make that happen is by loving you and keeping you close to me. You are protected and loved when you are with me. I felt something from the moment I saw you. I wasn't sure what it was. But now I believe I do. Yes, I believe I have fallen in love with you. I'm really happy. Thank you. Leo. My prayers were answered. I adore you, but I really need to go pee. Then we need to go down for breakfast, I said, as I began to move toward the restroom. Anna only grinned. Duke, you should have a full-time cook here. That way you'd have more time to do the things around here that need to be done. I offered my counsel over a plate of pancakes. I cannot afford one. When Louisa was living, she cooked. I did everything else. She was an excellent cook. I make do. You will not starve. How about Anna? She's an excellent cook. Perhaps she can work for you to help with the rent. I know we're the only ones here right now, but if you have any more lodgers, maybe she can help out a little. Is this acceptable with you, Anna? Of course. If that's good with you, Duke, I'd love to help. Okay, I'll think about it. I have eight persons. On the next plane, we'll see how things go. We all returned to eating our pancakes at the finish while we sat back in our recliners to digest. I asked Duke how to make a phone call. I need to phone someone and tell them where I am. Well, all I have is a radio. The staff in Yellowknife can connect you to an operator who can make the call for you. It's not cheap, but it's doable. Can it be used after breakfast? Sure. I'll show you how in a moment. I will just leave you two alone. I'm returning to the cabin to tidy up a bit. If we're expecting visitors, I'd like to look my best. She smiled at us before leaving. Making a phone call using his old radio setup was tricky, and I had to charge the call using a credit card. Duke let me use his so there would be no charge on mine that might be used to locate me. I will pay you back. Simply put it on my bill, I told him. Duke politely left me alone to speak. Hello, said the voice from the antique radio. Hello, Mom, it's Leo. Oh, God, Leo, how are you doing, baby? Where are you, Mom? I am fine. I'm currently out of the country and can't tell you where. If someone should inquire, you cannot lie. What's going on there? Is there anything I should know about? They are seeking for you, Leo. Mr. Bloom is madder than hell. When the factory burned down, he quickly accused you. The police have issued a warrant for your arrest. They even phoned the FBI. They came out and spoke to your father and me. We weren't sure where you were, so we couldn't tell them anything. I believe there is someone watching the house in case you turn up. Things are somewhat tense at the moment. What have you done with the bundle I gave you? I put it in the basement beneath some canned peaches. I did not open it. How about Sarah? 
I'm not too familiar with the sun. Sheila asked where you were. She stated she wanted to chat to you. Sarah was accompanying her. She's fine. She only wants her info. I'm not sure if Sheila was looking for you for her father or if she genuinely wanted to talk to you. She seemed quite unhappy. So, I don't want to talk to her. All I care about is Sarah. As long as she's okay, I'm fine, Leo. I know your divorce will be finalized in a few months, but could you at least chat to Sheila? Was what she done truly bad? You mentioned that she had an affair. Is there any way you two can talk and work things out for Sarah's sake? Mom, I only told you some of what happened. Sheila was having an affair during our entire marriage, but that's only half of it. I don't want to tell you or anyone else the rest since it would just harm Sarah. Perhaps someday, but not now. Okay, fair enough. I suppose I'll simply have to trust you. Mom, there is something else. I have met someone here. Her name is Anna. She's fleeing a difficult environment, just like me. I want you and Dad to meet her, but I'm not sure how I'll make that happen because I can't return home. I'll have to think out another approach. I simply wanted you to know that I am not as depressed as I was when you last saw me. I am better. I am actually happy when I am with Anna. I suppose I'll be okay as long as she's with me. Just wanted to let you know. Oh, Leo, I'm very delighted for you. You deserve to be happy after going through so much misery. Call and tell us what your plans are. I adore you, son. Take care. Bye, Mom. Oh, shit. What will I do now? The FBI is out looking for me. I did nothing but that. The authorities are accusing me of setting fire to Fat Bloom's factory. What will I do about Sarah? Christ, what am I going to do with Anna? Now that I've met her, I can't do anything to damage her. Hell, she has her own issues. What can I do to aid her? How do I get away from Sheila's elderly man? Be with Anna and create a future with her that is free of the past. Oh, what a disaster. The next day I observed as the float plane landed and dropped off eight soldiers. They carried expensive-looking baggage and fishing gear. Duke greeted them with a large, welcoming smile. Welcome back, fellas. It's nice to see you again. I believe this concludes your ninth year. Everything remains the same as last year, except the fishing is better. You got to view the photo of the one caught yesterday. It's a true monster. We all helped move the men's bags up the hill to the lodge. That afternoon, they launched four boats to go in. A little fishing before sunset. Duke asks Anna to help him in the kitchen with dinner. She prepares the fish. The men caught and boiled fresh vegetables. Duke prepares the salads and bread at her direction. For dessert, Anna made a simple pear cranberry crisp. The new lodgers were really eager about supper and requested that the chef come out and visit. Sheepishly, Anna entered the dining room. All I could do was sit at another table and observe. One of the males began speaking. Madam, we'd want to compliment you on your dinner. Everything was great. We expected Duke's regular rustic fare to match the lodge's rustic appeal. But this was entirely unexpected. I understand food. See, I run several restaurants in Detroit, Chicago, and Cincinnati, yet none of our greatest chefs could match what we just ate. I know better than to inquire about your secrets, but if you ever want to leave here and come work for me, you have a standing invitation. Thank you very much. I am a little embarrassed. Your compliments, and I shall keep your generous gift in mind. I'll see what surprises I can put up for you for breakfast. Anna approached my table, sat down next me, and rested her head on my shoulder. She smiled from ear to ear as the compliments boosted her self-esteem. The restaurant owner stood up and approached us. Sir, be proud of your wife. She's an excellent cook. I am serious about my offer. Please ponder about this. I answered yes, and I am proud of her. But we aren't married. We both met here. Refugees from harsh situations. Back back home. I am sad to hear that. The awful conditions at home, that is. Where are you from? Anna stated. I am from Plano, Texas. I told them I was from Henley, a little town in central Pennsylvania that no one had ever heard of. One of the other men piped out, stating, I know some people in Henley. What is your name? My name is Leo Baker. Nope. I don't recognize the name. Where do you work? I used to work for Bloom Enterprises. I was an accountant. Now that name, I know that son of a bitch. Bloom defrauded me and my manufacturing company out of a $1 million contract several years ago. Losing that deal knocked my business behind significantly. We're only now recovering. Yes, I recognize the individual you mention. I was married to his daughter. The man got up from his table and approached ours. No crap, he said. You are Ezekiel Bloom's son-in-law. I was. I recently got divorced. 
Let me tell you, I'm not sorry to be leaving that family. What happened? The restaurant owner inquired. Simply put, my wife cheated on me. I filed for divorce. Bloom, an old man, ensured that I left with nothing. There's no money, no job, no daughter, nothing. I came here to escape from everything for a time. That is where I met Anna. Here. Another man got up from the enormous table and approached. Did I hear someone mention Bloom Enterprises? Yes, I did. I used to work there. I mentioned that the name is quite recognizable to me. I work for the Justice Department's racketeering unit. And Mr. Bloom's company is on one of our watch lists. I can't go into detail, but the main line is that we're looking into Blossom for possible violations of a dozen or more federal and state laws. I'd love to speak with you about what you know in greater detail at some point. Wow, I had no idea about that, yet I have absolutely no doubts. Bloom owns everything in town, including the judge who presided over my divorce proceedings. One of his factories caught fire shortly before I left town, and I am the prime suspect. There is even a warrant out for my arrest, and I'm sure he had something to do with it. A fourth man got up from his table and approached ours. I apologize for interrupting, but I was listening from over there and wanted to pop in for a moment. You see, I am a lawyer. I'm simply getting to know things. How do you know your father-in-law owns the judge? That is a rather severe accusation, so I had a video of my wife and her lover together. I am doing well, you know. The judge completely rejected it. He told me it meant nothing. And if I ever revealed it to anyone, he said I'd be in jail faster than you could fart. That sounds just like the arrogant a-hole judge I know in Henley. I had always suspected that he stole some money. He also screwed me with a handful of my clients, and I wish I could prove it. It sounds like you need some assistance unscrewing. Perhaps we can speak and see what is possible. I know I want to help. The manufacturing worker answered yes. I'll go to whatever length to make Bloom pay for his actions. The fifth man stood up and approached. Listen, everyone. It sounds like we need some military-style organization here. I haven't seen much action since Afghanistan, and I'd want to take down some big shots to help the little fella. No offense, Mr. Baker. None were taken. I suggested that we go on the porch, have a few drinks, and discuss this with all of the high-priced brains in this group. You can bet the farm that we'll come up with something fantastic. What do you say, Mr. Baker? Anna added in. This is where I exit. Thank you, everyone, for everything. Leo, I'll see you at the cabin when you get back. Wake up and tell me about your intentions to take over the world. Gentlemen, good night, and thank you. From the porch, I saw Duke walk. Anna returned to our cabin. I heard him praise her for making the group happy and invite her back in the morning to help with breakfast. After they were out of sight over the hill, we began to discuss the alternatives. When I returned to my cabin far after dark, I found Anna curled up in bed asleep. She appeared so calm, as if she didn't care about anything. I knew that if I awakened her up, her problems would flood back. So I slipped into bed next to her, spooning her body into mine. Whether Sleeping Beauty realized it or not, we enjoyed another absolutely lovely day. That night, the Aurora Borealis worked its magic for us, but we were asleep in each other's arms and couldn't see anything. After breakfast, Anna and I sat on the dock to talk. Anna, before I tell you about our conversation last night, I have a question for you. What would you like to do with your husband? You haven't discussed divorce, but I don't see an option. I do not want you to return there and get hurt, or worse. What are your thoughts? I've considered filing for divorce, but if I did, he would follow me. And if he discovered me, I'd pay heavily. He's quite possessive. I considered just keeping concealed. And maybe he'll go on and meet someone else. I can't go back there. Why? What do you have in mind? Yesterday after you departed, we began discussing everything that had happened to me and my issues. I told them I didn't desire vengeance. I just wanted some justice. They have a lot of great ideas. And believe it or not, these folks have a lot of power and money between them. One of the individuals who did not come over to speak with us is the CEO of a large computer company and is worth millions, perhaps billions. He claimed he's simply shy. Remember the lawyer we discussed with? His name is Alan, and he knows Ken. My acquaintance is a private investigator who assisted me in learning more about Sheila and her partner. And the one man who came over and said, we need some military coordination, is a retired colonel from the Army Special Forces. He's quite something. He will coordinate whatever they do back home. 
When everything is ready, he will call, and I will be able to resume my work. All I have to do now is sit tight with you and wait for his call. Olio, that sounds great. I'm very delighted for you. Do you believe they can help me? So that's the finest part. That legal buddy knows a divorce lawyer in Dallas who he describes as an absolute shark. By the time we return, everything should be ready. And all you have to do is schedule one consultation with the attorney. Sign a couple papers and wait for Logan's signature before returning here. According to what he mentioned last night, getting your husband to sign will be the difficult part. The army major said to leave it to him. Anna, I think everything is going to be fine. I'm not sure what to say. Why would strangers want to help me? To them, I am merely a cook in a rural fishing resort. Why me? Believe it or not, there are nice individuals in the world. I'm sure these men see something in you that you might not see in yourself, something I already knew about. Anna beamed a gorgeous smile. We sat on the dock, holding hands, and looked out over the lake, each imagining our own notions about what might happen. Five days later, we assisted the eight fishermen in loading their bags and coolers full of freshly caught fish onto the float plane. I thanked each man for everything they were doing for us. Anarchist. Each one is on the cheek. Even the shyest computer geek. The restaurant owner handed Anna his business card and reminded her of his employment offer. Kindly call. He explained that after they flew off, Duke returned to the lodge, while Anna and I took a boat out onto the lake to sit and fish and talk. Anna wonders when this is all going to happen. I do not want to leave Duke without a cook. I'm guessing two weeks, perhaps three. If everything goes as planned, you should be back here within a few days. If you wish to visit your mother and sister, I can also arrange for it. Okay, I just want everything to be ended so we can be together. Will you return here afterward? Absolutely. When I finish cleaning up the debris from my previous life, I intend to return and start a new one with you. Anna moved over to sit next to me and rested her head on my shoulder. We must have caught the lone fish in the lake, since we didn't get a single nibble the entire time we sat there. We simply sat and enjoyed each other's touch. Three weeks later, at twilight, Anna and I sat on the porch of our cabin, discussing the trip home the following day. Both of us were nervous about what was going to happen. Despite the rigorous planning, Murphy's Law remained in effect. You are aware of the law which states that anything that may go wrong will go wrong? It's pretty certain that not everything will go as planned. But I had hope, Leo said. I'm really scared. If I wasn't in your arms right now, I could be back there, bound to a bed and screwed by everyone he knows. I'm still afraid he will discover me. Shush, that is not going to happen. You are currently and will continue to be safe. I promise to always be here to defend you. We sat with one another, watching the sun set behind the mountains. I tenderly touched her cheek as a tear streamed down her smooth skin. Her easy breathing indicated that she was now relaxed. Anna, since you have told me your complete story, I believe it is only fair that I tell you about my final demon. This is as difficult for me to discuss as it was for you to tell me about your past. But bear with me as I tell you, Anna. When I discovered that my daughter was not mine, I wanted to kill Sheila. When I discovered who her real father was, I intended to kill her lover as well. I was really irritated. If they had been around at that time, I believe I would have killed them. I am pleased they weren't. I went seeking for Sheila, and I discovered her with her lover. I knew just where to find them, and I saw them in love. I was so overwhelmed seeing them all together that I believe I... My brain has frozen. Anna, the man who made love to Sheila, was her father. She and Ezekiel Bloom have been lovers since before we got married. The photographs I had seen proved it, and the video I viewed showed them in his bedroom making love. I stated I knew exactly where they would be because she had mentioned she was going to see her father, and I found them in his bedroom, exactly like in the video. And Anna. Sarah is his daughter. That is why I do not want to inform anyone. It may be quite painful for her to discover that her father was also her grandfather. If anyone discovered that she was the result of an incestuous relationship, she would be shunned. I cannot have that. I'll do anything to protect her. Oh, God, Leo, that is astounding. How could she? I mean, who is she? What? Oh, shit. I just can't say anything because I want to strangle the woman who wounded you. My God, I am so sorry about your daughter. Damn, Anna. When I spotted them in bed together, I began rushing away. I stupidly assumed that divorcing her would resolve everything. Instead, it made matters worse. 
After I left, I came here to escape from everything, and I found you. Now I understand that we have a future. Everything will be over as soon as we put our history behind us. I know one thing for sure. And after all of this, we'll be together. That is, assuming you want me. Oh, Leo, of course I want you. You make me feel like a princess. The next few months may be rough, but when it's over, we'll be together forever. You don't realize how beautiful that sounds. You are aware that after tonight, we may not have the opportunity to spend time together for a while. I want you. I want to make love with you one more time before we leave. I really love you. We kissed for a while, standing in the fading daylight, when we parted lips. We both entered the modest cabin. I sat on the bed as Anna closed the door. We made love once she regained consciousness. She peered deeply into my eyes before kissing me on the lips. Wow. It was wonderful. Oh, wow. She relaxed and collapsed into my chest in a heap. Sleep was our last reward, Duke. Anna will return in a week at most. I'll be gone a while longer. I'm aware that the lake will freeze over and that flying in will be difficult, but I'll do all in my power to return before that happens. Just keep an eye on my little cook while I'm gone. Do not worry about me. I was here twenty years before you arrived, and I'll be here another twenty minutes after you depart. I will keep an eye on your little one for you. You two should just be careful and have a safe trip. Duke, an anarchist, slapped his cheek before entering the little plane's doorway. I shook the old buzzard's hand and followed her inside. Finally, the pilot entered, closed the door, and locked it. As we took off, I noticed Duke standing on the dock, waving goodbye. Anna and I entered the huge glass skyscraper in downtown Dallas to visit her shark of an attorney. I had a mental idea of what she might look like, but the little gray-haired woman who welcomed us into her office was very different from my expectations. Good afternoon. My name is Jane Oakes. She sat behind her large mahogany desk, smiling softly at Anna. Don't let my appearance deceive you. When the opponent is unfamiliar with me, it can work in my favor. But after they've met me, they'd rather not see me again. Now, Anna, I've heard everything from my close friend Alan— but I'd like to hear it from you over the next half hour. Anna recounted her experiences with happiness, misery, beatings, and forced sex. She even mentioned me. It is worse than I was taught to expect, but do not worry. We'll put an end to this. You will have your divorce and anything else you desire. I am quite confident. Don't worry. I'll simply acquire the documents for you to sign, and then explain what I expect you to do from here on out. Anna burst into tears as we drove to her sister's house after signing everything. I wasn't sure whether these were tears of grief or delight. The wailing continued until we reached the freeway, when she wiped her tears, blew her nose, and turned to place her hand on mine on the steering wheel. I keep thanking you all the time, don't I? I can't wait until it's over. She turned to stare out the window, watching the countryside go by. Anna was reborn in her sister's residence. She smiled and played like a child with her nieces and nephews, running around the backyard chasing their large dog. I just sat and watched a new woman emerge, and it made me love her even more. Her mother arrived later in the day, and the three women vanished while the guys sat in the backyard with a beer or two. They eventually emerged from whatever conference they were having. Everyone looked teary-eyed. Anna and her sister left to start dinner, and her mother took my hand and brought me out to the front yard. Mr. Baker, Anna told us what her husband did to her, and she told us everything about you. She stated that you have some issues of your own to resolve before you two can be together. She also stated that she loved you and felt safe around you. I believe my kid does not always know what is best for her, but she is a big girl and can do anything she wants. I just want you to know that if you ever do to her what her jackass ex-husband did, I will track you down and kill you like a dog. You'd best believe me. I'll locate you and kill you where you stand. Do you comprehend what I'm saying? Treat her well and I'll bring you my amazing 16-layer cake every Christmas. I am putting my trust in you. Take care of my tiny girl. She deserves the finest. I am sure the shock of her warning was visible on my face. I could only answer yes, ma'am. She reached up, grabbed my head, brought me down to her level and kissed my forehead. She smiled at me with the same smile Anna does. She took my hand again and led me back to my lounge chair and beer. Every day we stayed at her sister's home. Every night we stayed at a nearby motel on the road, and Anna was incorrect. 
We did, in fact, have time to make love several times while waiting for her attorney's call. Five days after we arrived in Dallas, Anna received the phone call she had been waiting for. Hello, Anna. This is Jane. Well, everything is done. Your husband signed the papers, making you a free woman. And after the legal system has completed its work, the decision will be final. This could take anywhere from three to six months. So until you obtain the official proclamation, you are still married. You can travel anywhere and do anything you want except marry again. Wait a while on that. I'll admit that when I spoke with your ex, he was very insistent that you two would stay married. But, as I understand it, he had a visit from someone in the army and was convinced that signing the paperwork was in his best interests. I'm not sure who your pals are, but I might want to borrow them sometime. I have your phone number in case something important happens. Take care and have a good life. And with that, Anna's abusive marriage ended. I brought everyone out to celebrate at a local ice cream store. Everyone had a wonderful day, especially Anna. Love you? Just go back and keep duck company, I advised. We were standing on the concourse of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, holding hands and saying farewell. Anna had to go to one terminal to get to her flight, whereas I had to go to another. Everything is going to be okay. I'll phone Duke and leave a message when I arrive at my folks' house. I'm not sure when I'll be able to call again, but when I do, it will be with excellent news. Take care and remember that I love you. I adore you, too. She cried. We separated. Our fingertips were the last thing to touch. We turned to go our separate ways. It's a two-hour journey from the Harrisburg airport to Henley, and I arrived after nightfall. I didn't want to be detected too soon— so I parked a few blocks from my parents' house and strolled through the woods on the same paths I used to take as a child. I approached the back door with my suitcase and knocked. What's going on? Hey, who is there in the rear hammering on the door? My dad's voice sounded lovely in a macho way. It's me, Dad, Leo. Damn, Mom, it's Leo. Come out here, boy. Get in here before someone notices you. Dad, it's lovely to be home. Hello, Mom. Boy, I'm pleased to see you, too. Listen, I have to tell you what I've cooked up so you don't worry. We should sit down and chat now. Let's enter the living room. I just want to put my feet up and rest. I spent the rest of the evening telling my folks about my plans for the next few days. If everything went according to plan, it should be over within a week. They chuckled at the sheer boldness of the idea at times and at the fate of the persons engaged at others. We had a fantastic time and I felt rested and ready to sleep in my old bed. I called and told Duke and Anna that I was safe and that everything was fine. Early in the morning, I heard the newspaper land in the driveway in front. I strolled out in my shorts and robe, picked it up, and stood in front of the car, stretching. The biggest day. That should let everyone know that Leo has returned home, I whispered to myself. It barely took 30 minutes for three police cars to arrive. Knock, knock. I answered the door and listened. Leo Baker, I have a warrant for your arrest. Please come out discreetly. I turned, winked at my parents, and walked out. You know, handcuffs aren't as unpleasant as I expected. Sure, I had to ride to the station with my hands behind my back, but it didn't hurt all that much. I was photographed, fingerprinted, and placed in a cell by myself. Now all I had to do was sit and wait for the shit to hit the fan, which didn't take long. Within an hour, the stately Mr. Bloom stormed into the station and demanded to see me. I could hear his voice all the way back in my cell. Within a minute, he was standing in front of me, blazing bullets at me from his steely gray eyes. I'm going to burn you up. You have the audacity to destroy one of my factories and then return here as if nothing had happened. I will make sure you never see the light of day again. And you can simply say goodbye to your darling girl. She'll forget you ever existed. When I finish with you, you will wish you had died. I watched his tirade and thought, God, I love seeing that big vein on the side of his head pulse like that. I didn't have a chance to say anything to him when he was summoned back to the office by a frantic-looking deputy. I simply sat back down and listened. I heard a lot of crying and screaming coming from the outside office, and eventually someone yelled, Go get him now! The same wide-eyed deputy returned and unlocked my cell, telling me to follow him. I came inside the office and saw the lawyer I met at Duke's, Allen, standing there glaring at Mr. Bloom. Mr. Bloom was now a brighter shade of red than he was two minutes before. My lawyer pal, Allen, said, 
Mr. Baker, are you all right? Have you been treated well? I'm okay. I'm just a little perplexed about why I'm here, that is all. Well, we're just about to clear everything up. Alan got out his cell phone and called, simply saying, We're ready now. In about a minute, a tall man in a suit entered, accompanied by two state police officers. He approached Mr. Bloom and held out a manila packet. Mr. Ezekiel Bloom, the beet red faced man, answered, Yes. What do you want? Mr. Suit stated, Sir, I have a warrant for your arrest. The charge includes meddling with government authorities, specifically Judge Owen Carter and City Fire Marshal Thomas Johnson. I also have a federal arrest warrant for you on charges of racketeering and money laundering. I have issued a cease and desist order for all Bloom Enterprises operations until a federal grand jury may convene on specific charges. I've attached a copy of the case we're filing against Bloom Enterprises in the name of Leo Baker for wrongful termination. This lawsuit notification is now being communicated to corporate management. Finally, I have another warrant for your arrest on the accusation of incest with Sheila Baker, your daughter. A warrant is currently being served on her. He turned to the deputy sheriff, handed him an envelope, and announced, Sir, as a duly appointed official of this town, I hereby notify you of a lawsuit against the town of Henley for wrongful imprisonment. You are both duly served. I had to sit down to hide my big fat smile. Mr. Suit turned to me and handed me another manila folder, stating, Mr. Baker, I have a court order quashing all charges against you until the fire marshal's report is reviewed. In addition, a hearing to examine your divorce decree will be held tomorrow at 10 a.m. Another judge will hear your case. The former presiding judge is currently being investigated for misconduct in office. Throughout the process, we were served with legal documents. My attorney, Allen, never took his gaze away from Mr. Bloom, who, by the way, was now sitting in another chair looking extremely depressed. Leo, let's go. You are a free guy. Allen spoke rather loudly. We turned and walked out the front door. He smiled all the time. When we pulled up in front of my parents' house, he drove me there. He turned to me, extended his hand to shake mine, and said, Good luck, Leo. I will see you at the hearing in the morning. All of this is a small gift from your fishing mates. I believe things will become a little quieter around here, at least for you. God, I love tiny towns. Good night, gentle guy. He nodded, saying goodbye. My parents came out and greeted me at the curb as Alan drove away. How did things go, son? My father inquired. Better than I could have possibly expected. Let's go inside and get some food. I'm starving. The divorce review hearing was very different from the first. First, Sheila arrived, accompanied by only one attorney. Second, as we entered, the new judge appeared very anxious. And third, let's just say I had some hope this time because Alan was sitting next to me. The evaluation lasted nearly four hours. This time, evidence of Sheila's infidelity and incest was accepted, and almost quickly the judge mentioned that she was an unsuitable mother. In the end, he reversed a few important points. Sheila had a lot more income saved than I did, therefore the child support I had to pay was withdrawn. Child custody was reversed. I was granted primary physical custody. I was now going to receive child support. The house remained hers, and the income share remained consistent. In other words, I'm still broke. I wasn't concerned because I had Sarah. Sheila remained silent during the hearing. She merely sat there, staring at her hands on her lap. Her lawyer spoke for her when he needed to, but she kept quiet. She looked dreadful, but she remained silent. When the hearing ended, I requested if the lawyers could leave so I could speak privately with Sheila. I started talking, Sheila. I am going to keep this brief. I did not do any of this for vengeance. I simply wanted a divorce. I just want to be as far away from you as possible. The sight of you makes me nauseous. You have harmed me more than you can ever fathom, with what you and your father did when your father took over and attempted to railroad me. I got angry. Everything that transpired was his and your fault. He was always successful in obtaining his desired outcomes. But this time, he received exactly what he deserved. He tried to prevent me from Sarah, which nearly crushed me. I made it out alive thanks to a woman I met while hiding and contemplating. I discovered something in her that you will never have. A heart and moral compass for determining what is good and wrong. And I love her. As for Sarah, I never want you to see her again. I will file a restraining order against you for this. I would not allow even your filthy shadow to be near her. I would wait till you died, a hard, lonely dying. 
and I pledge to come and pee on your grave. Meanwhile, you and your father may do whatever you choose. I do not care. Please keep away from me. Do you understand what I've said? Sheila simply nodded. Yeah, she never looked up. I walked out of the small hearing room feeling joyful than I'd been in a long time. I thought about Anna and Sarah the entire time I went out of the building. Later that night, I held a secret ceremony in the backyard of my parents' home. I burned the DNA test results papers that sparked the whole issue. The only person I ever told about her biological father was Anna. Almost two months ago, I landed on this same little lake in the same little float plane. I didn't like it back then, and I don't think I like it any better now. But now I had Sarah with me. She considers it an amusement park ride. We drew up to the dock. I saw Anna standing there, just as gorgeous as I remembered. The pilot opened the door and moored the aircraft to the pier. I lifted Sarah up in my arms and exited with a smile nearly as big as the lake when she noticed us. As we approached, she stepped to the side and wrapped her face around Sarah to give me a welcome home kiss. All the while, we were kissing. Sarah brushed her hands over each of our faces, making small noises that sounded nearly like words. I was glad to be home. It's strange that I now think of Dukes as home because Anna is there. Anna glanced at me after we kissed and said, Leo, I have some bad news. Duke suffered a stroke. It's not too severe, but he lost use of his right hand and now walks like the original John Wayne. He'll be fine in time, but he needs someone to help him operate this institution. I said I'd remain. What are your thoughts? I was thinking as we landed that it felt like I was returning home. I assumed it was because of you. But there has to be more to it. Perhaps this is the location that seems most like home. But whatever it is, I am here for you. And I will be with you forever. We'll care for the old buzzard and our little girl at the same time. I am just delighted to be back. I missed you and adore you. Welcome home, my love. It's been five years since I first visited Duke's Lodge. Anna and I got married in the spring, following our first winter there. Sarah enjoyed her time here, especially the elderly teddy bear she played with. The ancient teddy bear's name was Duke. We gave Sarah two younger brothers to play with the following year. The twins, Duke and Wayne. Yes, we named them after Old Duke. Are now three years old and, like any three-year-old boys, are getting into everything. Anna is a wonderful mother. Every day I thank God for putting us here to find one another. I adore her more and more each day. Oh, and Anna is expecting our third child, a little girl. This time it's due in three months. We're still deciding on a name, although we're both leaning toward Louisa. Since our first visit, the lodge has undergone significant changes. The lodge house has doubled in size, and the dirt route connecting the pier to the lodge has been paved with elegant stone paths. We've built five new cabins on the hill and a number of new boats. The pier is wider, and there is a lot of native artwork throughout the site, primarily totem poles and animal carvings. Duke managed the upgrades personally. The funds came from the settlement of claims against Bloom and the municipality of Henley. Anna likes her new gourmet kitchen, which was generously provided by an anonymous restaurant owner from Detroit, Chicago, and Cincinnati. We even have satellite communications, courtesy of an anonymous computer whiz. Another unidentified company sent us three enormous racks of solar collectors and a solar power generator. Since the changes, the place has been packed. There is also a wait list for the most popular dates. We now match what the website claims about us. When my parents came to visit after the twins were born, they told me that Sheila no longer has any contact with her father and lives a reclusive lifestyle. Mr. Bloom will be on probation for another six years on a federal racketeering conviction. I could care less about either of them. Duke died around a year ago, leaving everything to Anna and me. We buried his ashes alongside his beloved Louisa near the park bench on the hill. We see him whenever we can, and his spirit lives on in the lodge. We truly miss the old buzzard.